All right, well, welcome to Building Blocks. I think this is week 11. I had to go back and look um, due to the break of the summer and then also being under the weather, but I believe it is the 11th week of our Building Blocks courses. As I was kind of telling uh, some of the people as you kind of get in and get settled, um, this year is the first year we've ever had any type of midweek gathering outside of house church, which is just prayer and fellowship. Um, in worship. And so this year, part of our goal was to go through and do doctrine and theology, the basis for this church, why we believe what we believe, um, why we've arrived at the uh, the decision we have. Um, obviously, I want to make sure to tell everybody that like I'm a big diversity person. I believe the Israelites were diverse, all 12 tribes. And so just because you don't share the same doctrine or theology as the church, as long as it's not divisive, it's not like, okay, now, now we're going to be asked to leave the church. That's not how it works. Um, I think we have two classes left before we take our winter break. And then when we start back in, in the, uh, in the first part of the spring next year, we're going to have different teachers, a whole different style. We won't have the whole camera and not trying to put it on the website as core doctrines and statements of faith. And so we'll look a little bit different than it currently does, but because we pull people from all over the city, um, wanted to make sure that I didn't have to have these conversations over coffee a hundred times. It's like, hey, look, you want to know the fundamental theologies and doctrines of the church? Uh, we have them recorded for you uh, to be able to go in and do that. Uh, some of the scripture references tonight for those who are new. Um, tomorrow, I believe, as long as I'm feeling well, uh, this video along with all of my notes will be posted on the website under the church resources. And we do that with every sermon, every teaching we record. Um, we post it, uh, whether it's on Sunday or Monday afterwards, we post a complete transcript, a podcast of it, sermon notes, all that kind of stuff. So that way, if you have questions and you want to go back and look at that and dive into that a little bit more on your own, you can do so. And so uh, all the previous building blocks are on the website. They're on YouTube. You can go back, look at the study guides, look at how, uh, we, came, how we came out on the Holy Spirit, on the Sabbath, stuff like that. It's kind of important. Uh, obviously, we all love the Sabbath because we all come to a Sabbath church, but not every Sabbath church has the same stance on the Sabbath. And so it's important to kind of figure out where we're at um, as a church. And so that way you kind of understand. Once again, that doesn't mean you have to leave this church. If you have a disagreement, it just means you understand why and how we're approaching those teachings. So let's go ahead and start in with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the cooler weather. We thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight to, to learn more about your word, uh, to grow, um, and to have the mind of Christ, as well as to have you continue to put a new heart and a new spirit inside each and every one of us. And so, Lord, tonight again, we lift a Brent as he's still under the weather and a couple of the other families who have reached out to who are struggling with uh, the seasonal allergies and the things that are going around. Lord, we ask that you would be present with them, that you would heal them and give them comfort in this time. In Yeshua's name, amen. So this week is on discipleship. Discipleship is a really, really big topic. And before we start to uh, put out what is our discipleship plan um, for next year and the years moving forward, uh, we should probably talk about what, what this church deems as discipleship. Um, the disciple, by the very basic English definition, is a follower of Jesus during his life, especially one of the 12 apostles. It's also, take Jesus out, there is a just a, a, a worldly view of the word disciple, and that is a student of a teacher, a leader, or a philosopher. Um, I don't consider myself a teacher. I definitely do not consider myself a philosopher. Um, uh, a leader, well, I, I think we all lead something at some point in time in our life. So by default, I think I would be considered a leader of some, some element. I lead our house sometimes well, sometimes not. Um, the Hebrew term for a disciple is Talmud. And Talmudim is a group 
of people. So in the Hebrew roots, in the messianic corners of Christianity, you'll hear a lot of times uh, the Talmud, not to be mistaken with the Talmud, they are not the same. The Talmud is the extra biblical writings of the commentaries and opinions of rabbis and Jewish scholars over many, 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 many years. Uh, Talmudim is a group of disciples. You'll hear me a lot of times in um, in my sermons, I actually prefer, rather than the term disciple or discipleship, I prefer apprentice. Um, I think it is not a word that's used quite as much now. And unfortunately, it gets a little bit more traffic in the political spectrum for individuals who had shows under that title or a version of that title. But apprentice to me is, is, is a better English word. It implies that you are, have the intention of doing something to be taught. So um, I want to go and I want to become a auto mechanic. So I am going to become an apprentice under somebody who already does this, somebody who has this ability. And by being an apprentice, my goal is to be taught to learn and hopefully be as good, if not better at that skill than somebody else. And so I use the term apprentice because I believe that it implies that we should want to be like Jesus. So we're learning constantly, applications, all those things. And then we should also want to teach other people how to do that as well. Uh, so as we go along. But um, uh, Talmudim is used a lot in, in different corners of, of Christianity. Uh, and so Talmudim would be the Hebrew, Hebrew terminology that would be used for that. The English word disciple comes from the Greek word Mathetes, mathetes. Okay, that's your opinion of Greek. There's lots of opinions on Greek, so um, I don't profess to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar. Um, but that Greek terminology, that Greek word, uh, means to learn. So again, the concept is basically the same. Um, it is is something that sh implies you're doing something with the goal to learn something, to be able to do something. Uh, in the core structure of these definitions, the term disciple is an active word. So um, I've been, my wife and I have been in this corner of Christianity with the feasts and the festivals and all those things for uh, 17 years. It's literally had hundreds of different terminologies and names throughout the years of what they called it. But um, discipleship or to be a disciple in where I've come from in Christianity, it was really utilized as more, here is a library of theological teachings or commentaries or opinions on the Bible, learn these and then become the teacher of these things. It was not as much about trying to change all facets of your life to, to be molded into the image of Christ. It was more of understand what a, a teacher has put out their extensive library and be able to regurgitate that. And we see that uh, even now, um, in, in the Messianic Hebrew Roots corners of Christianity, you will see uh, a, t a terminology or a title for a set of teachings. And then you'll see now that the original teacher has others who are now younger who are teaching the same thing under the same title. And so there's students who are now teachers and, and they're going out and doing that. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and I don't want to imply that I believe that there is, that's incomplete with what I believe the Bible tells us about being a disciple. A disciple is an active thing that you should be doing. Discipleship is an active thing. It's not just what I learned. I listened to all Chris's sermons and now I can regurgitate exactly what he thinks on these things and now I'm gonna go teach those because that implies that, that you have arrived. You've learned everything there is to learn. Well, if we're being a disciple of Christ and Christ was perfection, then the reality is, is that our whole entire life should be an ongoing discipleship process because we're never going to be able to obtain that on our own. And so we should be striving our entire life to be in a discipleship of Christ. Uh, so it is active. One who is learning, studying, modeling, apprenticing to be like their teacher or mentor. I also, I, I, I know it's, it's semantics to define terms, but again, for 17 years, I've been in this corner of Christianity where people use words interchangeably. Um, and, and, and I've watched it happen in the Messianic 
understand a Keeper Roots movement. I know it happens in other denominations, but the reality is I've been out of a lot of those denominational lines, so I can't really speak to that. And the core of our church traditionally has come from a similar background as myself. So uh, while I know there's exceptions to the rule in our church, I do want to make sure that we are addressing because of our history, our origin story, this is why we've come out where we've come out because a lot of the people who are currently with us or, or kind of watching to see is this a church I want to be a part of, a community I want to be a part of or not, they have a similar background to us. So teacher normally implies in the Messianic Hebrew side, this is the predominant leader of any ministry. For 40, 45 years, as there's been this um, Jesus revolution and this turn back to the Hebrew passionate, the, the Jewish elements, the sages, teacher has been a dominant role. Most of the ministries have been online ministries, not all, but the person who has occupied kind of the spiritual leadership operates as a teacher. They don't operate in a shepherd's role. Most of them don't have congregations. Some of them who do have congregational gatherings will tell you, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a shepherd. I'm, I'm not an overseer in that. That's not the gift I have. I'm a teacher. A uh, Bible teacher is also used a lot. And so I want to make sure you understand my understanding and how I'm going to use that terminology because it could imply something different based upon the background. Ian is a teacher to his children. He teaches his children things. Alyssa is a teacher to her children, sometimes a teacher to Ian. And so that's a joke. It's not serious. They both teach each other well. They balance each other very well. We all teach people things in life. Some of us are more willing to do that and accept teaching than others. But in, in some regards, you have a teacher role in what you do. If you oversee any persons in a job, you are a teacher because ultimately part of your job should be to teach them things. Um, hey, don't do that. Uh, uh, that's maybe part of your role. If you have children, you're a teacher. Uh, if you're married, you're both teaching each other. You just are. I, I told you in my sermon on Saturday, I did not know how to do laundry when I got married. My wife was my teacher. She taught me how to do laundry. And after 20 years, she doesn't allow me to do it anymore because I still mess it up. But she's still a teacher. She's making a calculated decision. So when I talk about teacher, I want you to understand that's my concept. If I say Bible teacher or I say the office of teacher, okay, then I'm talking about the biblical apostolic type of role of teacher. But when I'm talking about a teacher, I'm using that more interchangeably as we are all teachers of someone in our life. We have opportunities to be in a teacher role. The word disciple appears roughly 260 times throughout the New Testament. That's, that, that's a lot of times for a word or a concept to be intertwined within the Gospels, which means it is important to the message not only of Jesus, but to the message of what we should be doing on a regular basis. So uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll come up with teachings and theologies and series off words that are mentioned two, three times. You know, there's a lot of words in the series on end times, the Antichrist. There is tons of teachings on the Antichrist. The Antichrist is barely mentioned in that type of terminology in the scripture. And Antichrist itself isn't even mentioned in the book of Revelation, which is where a lot of the teaching ends up being when they talk about the beast and some of those other things. So it's important to kind of understand if something is throughout the scriptures a lot of times, by default, it's important to the Lord. And it might have a little bit more importance than something that's just mentioned maybe once. Not to discredit that, but... If my wife just said once a year, I love you, we might have marital problems. If my wife says, I love you every day, well, guess what? There's 365 days in a year. So every year, my wife has said at least once 365 times that she loves me, which means I probably think it's important to know that my wife loves me. Same thing when God is talking or God is speaking through vessels. This is a pillar, disciple, being a disciple and discipleship is a pillar of the calling of any follower of Jesus. Why is discipleship important? Human beings as a whole are tribal. 
There is uh, an author I used to read a lot of, and I still really enjoy his writings. Um, he, he deals predominantly in the marketing realm of things, but his name is Seth Godin. Seth Godin. Um, he has podcasts and stuff like that. And uh, he's all about finding your tribe in the marketplace, in business, in, in, in your company, whatever. He's all about finding your tribe, finding those. Uh, we read a book by somebody else that's called Find Your People. Um, but people are tribal. Human beings are tribal. We, we like to protect our area, and we also like to find our people. And when we find our people, sometimes we get a little territorial over those. I know nobody in this room has ever felt jealous over relationships when somebody else comes in and they're starting to talk to their friends more. It's never happened. We're all the light of the world. We're still salty, so we're the salt of the world. But we are tribal, and we always have been since creation. So whether you like it or not, we are being discipled apprenticing every day by somebody or something. If you are an employee of a workplace, you are being discipled by your boss because your boss is telling you, well, I'd prefer you to do it this way. Well, that is teaching you that they don't want you to do it the way you're doing. Now you still have the right to not do it that way, but guess what happens? Normally you don't have a job or you don't get promoted, or something negative happens. So there's, there's that hierarchy of the tribal leadership in the marketplace, the workplace, where there's kind of consequences if you're not willing to be discipled. This is very different in modern society because in my parents' day, and in my grandparents' day especially, you got a job whether it was Sears Roebuck or it was um, Lazarus or it was, you know, the United Postal Service, you got a job. And part of the goal was to rise up in the company and retire in that company. And there was a lot of amenities that were given to people because of that. And so you had a lot of discipleship. The longer you were there in that organization, the more they felt like you understood their way. And so you could retire with that company. Nowadays, I think I read an article of the other day that said um, every three years, you want to jump as an employee from your current company to another company. And by doing that, you can leverage your maximum capability to produce finances as well as take advantage of your youthfulness. So the culture is completely shifted from you spend 50, 60 years being discipled and mentored and discipling others in longevity and retire in an organization to now they're actually counseling you that within three years, it's good for you to hop, skip, and jump onto the grass is greener on the other side. I don't know if one is better than the other. I've kind of been out of the marketplace now for since 2011. Uh, and, and so I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing like anything, there's positives and negatives to that. But you are being discipled by somebody or something every day. Discipleship is not just a Christian concept. So when, when people talk about discipleship, a lot of times they think about church, especially if you are a Christian or you're a believer. But the reality is, is we just prove in one other area of your life, you're being discipled. So um, if you have addictions in your life, if you are, are somebody who struggles with alcohol, um, who you hang out with is discipleship. Because if your buddy comes to you and he's like, oh, hey, Tyson, you can have four beers. That's no problem. You're going to be safe. They're trying to teach you and disciple you that it is appropriate for you to be in this area, but in these boundaries. Where you might feel, um, no, I probably should stay away from any bar and I shouldn't have four beers. And so if you continue in a relationship with them, you're constantly at odds with whether you're going to make an adjustment or they're going to make an adjustment. That's part of being taught mentored, or a student. So it's important to understand if this is already interwoven in everything that happens out there, whether it's your job, your marriage, your friendships, the marketplace, um, uh, when, when you're out and you're, you're just watching culture in general. So clothing, how you do your hair, how you do it, like all of those have influences in your life to some degree. So when we talk about discipleship from a believer's standpoint, we need to combat the world with discipleship and what it means to be a follower of Christ. This is why what you watch, what you see, those are just as important. What you eat, just as important. You know, a lot of times people will say like, you know, well, it doesn't really matter what I eat. Well, I mean, over a period of time, it does. It, it matters what you watch. Um, the amount of Christians who watch television shows that 
I, I'm not even willing to go look up is, is mind-blowing to me because what you put in yourself has an effect. What you put in your home has an effect. I also, because of where we come from, need to talk about the other polar opposite, and these are the extremes. But this doesn't mean that you go looking for every type of conspiracy in every Disney poster, in every Pixar movie, or like, you can't live your life paralyzed by fear. You can't. But there is a happy medium in there. If you want the Holy Spirit to do more in your life, you have to make more space for the Holy Spirit and less space for the other spirits of this world. In Matthew's gospel, we see Jesus give this command. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you till the end of the age. In Mark's gospel, Mark 16, 14 through 10, he says, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. I mean, he means that. If he says it in the Bible, like, that doesn't mean they're going to learn Latin. They will speak in new tongues and they will pick up serpents with their hands and they will drink any deadly poison and it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Acts chapter 1 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're given instructions to participate with God in spreading the news of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We're also given tools to help with those tasks that call the power of the Holy Spirit, or as Paul calls it, he calls it the Spirit of Jesus. Some of the references of, of that terminology is Philippians 1.19, Galatians 4.6, and then also the writings in Acts 16.7 by Luke. Um, and I give you those references so that if you want to go study those a little bit more, because a lot of times we get, it, we get people who question, you know, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? What do those do? We already did a building blocks on that. So that, that one kind of gives you more of an outline of where we are at as a church. But it is important to understand how when Paul's referencing the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus, this nullifies a lot of the arguments that somehow the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus and then Yahweh God are not somehow interconnected with each other. Um, it also ties into Mark's gospel when he's talking about the fact that Jesus is having some pretty stern conversations, giving them a, a, a goal. You need to go do this. You need to believe. And then it also says that even though Jesus is now seated, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he's still participating by helping, by accompanying signs and confirming the message that they are speaking and that they are teaching. So what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus? Uh, First, before I even go down that, we need to acknowledge that before you can walk in discipleship, because everybody wants to know what discipleship is, and it's become more of a topic in our church recently than ever before, which is really a good thing. Like, I don't say that as a bad thing. That's a positive thing. But we have to understand, like I said early on, discipleship is an action-based thing. It's something that is, is ever-present. Before we start to look at what being a disciple of Jesus is, we have to first understand what did Jesus first ask them to do. So that linear timeline, before you can be a disciple of Jesus and you can just sit down with him and eat dinner with him, what was the first thing he asked them to do? Matthew four eighteen through 19. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he and two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said, Jesus says to them, follow me, 
and I will make you fishers of men. You can't see this because you don't have my outline, but it will be on the, the website. Follow me is big, bright, and bold. He says, follow me. First thing he says is follow me. So the first thing he's asking them to do is cease from whatever you're doing and come with me. So the first invitation to be a disciple of Jesus, what does that look like? You have to first answer the call. You have to follow Jesus. You have to answer the call, whatever you're doing in your life, whatever takes up the time that distracts you from God, you have to first answer the call to to follow Jesus. Put him first. Be present. Be ready. Do something that is different. If if every day you have the same, same old, same old, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to go to Starbucks at seven. By nine, I'm clocking in. By this, I'm doing this. And, and there's no room for God to work. There's no time for Jesus. There's no time to talk. Well, then discipleship should kind of be off your radar because there's not enough time for you to give Jesus the power and the time and the presence to actually be disciple. This is no different than a personal relationship. Annie, if you were to call my wife and you were to say, hey, I really want to, I want to be mentored by you. I don't know why you would do that, but maybe you would, like, let's just say. And so in doing that, like, that's awesome until nobody ever calls. Until you can't ever find a time to get together. Till you, you never respond to each other's text messages. Till there's no dialogue between the two of you. First, you must do something. You must, you must put an importance to change what you're doing. I.e., they were fishermen, casting nets, and follow Jesus. Think of how ironic this must be, too. Fishermen are out there. They're doing their thing. Here comes this guy. And he walks in and he says, follow me. I'm sure there were some mumblings. John, the, the baptizer, he was out there in the wilderness doing like, there's some mumblings like, hey, there's this guy going around. He's different from them. But there's a lot of trust they put in Jesus in that time. So fast forward to 21st century, everybody in this room has church hurt. Everybody's been hurt by somebody. Somebody has damaged a relationship. Somebody has made promises to you and they didn't keep them. Um, honestly, it's the people you let in the closest are the ones who can inflict the most harm upon you. And so the, the idea that you're somehow going to allow yourself to open up and be discipled by somebody, that's kind of a scary concept because you've already been hurt. Something's already happened to you. And now you're going to open yourself up to a, a relationship that you could potentially get hurt again. Well, again, if you're unwilling to do that, then you're not going to be discipled in a positive manner. Again, you'll be influenced by the world and everything else that happens around you. But I also want to remind you, we're talking about what Jesus said to do, and Jesus was perfection. None of us are perfection. So while we're attempting to take what Jesus has called us to do and implement it in the world, none of us are Jesus. Yes, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have the guide that's there, but it doesn't mean that we're not going to make a mistake. I'm friends with Ian. We work together. He's a worship pastor here. There's times I've said things to him that I'm sure I shouldn't have said. Thank you. You still have a job. (laughs) I'm sure there are times. And so, but the difference is, is we've come to a place where we're we're mature enough to understand that neither one of us is Christ and that we're going to make mistakes. And so the moment we make a mistake, we don't just immediately say, oh, we're not going to disciple each other. We're not going to be friends anymore. Our relationship is done. No. We find a way to work through that. By the way, that is also a part of discipleship because as you read through the Gospels and Jesus' interaction, especially Peter, Peter was a little bit of a type A. If he was a child, one of your children, he would have been the tough one. He would have been the one who talked back. He would have been the one when you asked him to do the chores, that would have been like, why don't you do the chores? Like that would have been Peter. So God gives us all of those. Yes, I have them. And she's telling on herself right now. But God gives us all of these dynamics to hope show us that the kingdom isn't some sort of cult that requires us all to become one personality with one thought, wear the same clothes, walk the same way, think the same way. We can't do that. We were all created in Ephesians, it tells us, with a gift. We were all created before we were born to have a unique calling on each and every one of us. Now we need to figure out how to do that as one body. Mark chapter 1, 16 through 17 says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
See how ironic it is? There's so many similarities with the Gospels. Uh, And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Luke 5, 9 through 11. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. John chapter 1, 35 through 39 The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So John, who was preparing the way for the Lord, announcing the coming of Jesus, the Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach, he had apprentices who were following him, probably standing there as witnesses in the Jordan and in other bodies of water, baptizing people, uh, preaching and teaching. So he had his understudies with him. And he looked at Jesus as he had walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. John's two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. At this point, Jesus didn't even call them, but they heard the testimony of the man they saw as a teacher and the honor that John had placed on Jesus, and they followed Jesus. Um, I do encourage you, just as a funny note, verse 38 through 39 Different translations take the, par- uh, the, the parables and the concepts of the words and they translate them different. I don't have this one, the one that is funny in my notes because I use ESV predominantly when I'm doing this. But there is a version that basically says, it says, Jesus turned around and saw them following and he said to them, what are you seeking? There are some that says, what do you want? So, so think about this for a second. Like, uh, you know, I don't want to diminish the holiness of Jesus, but Jesus Jesus had a personality. He was fully human. And so I can see Jesus, like these two random men are just like following him. Like, like think of it this way. Like I go outside and I'm going over to Eagle One Pizza and I turn around and there's just two random people for the church following me, not saying anything, nothing, just total creeper vibes following me over to Eagle One Pizza. And I turn around and I'm like, what do you want? And Jesus is like, that's one of the translation is, what do you want? And they said to him, Rabbi, what, where are you staying? Rabbi is a Hebrew word that also means teacher, implies a spiritual leader. So interestingly enough, John was the one who they were underneath. They were learning from John, the baptizer. And so John, his disciples start to follow Jesus off the testimony of John, and they immediately give Jesus a title of honor without any knowledge. It's not like they were walking and they weren't being discipled. They didn't already get a chance to go to, to Chili's and, and have baby back ribs, beef ribs, um, with extra barbecue sauce. Like they, it wasn't even that like that wasn't happening. They noticed something different about Jesus. And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So he's inviting them to do something. And then he's inviting them to watch. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. That's John 1, 35 through 39. And then John chapter 1, 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said, follow me. Jesus gives an invitation that requires something. We must take the first step. We must be willing to follow. We must be able to leave behind or adjust to show that we're willing participants in the discipleship process. Then afterwards, we must bear fruit. I want to make sure that that's a lot of times we talk about, well, first you must do these things. That's awesome. A lot of people say they want to be discipled. A lot of people come and they say, hey, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to spend more time with you in April and, and we want to be discipled and we want to learn, you know, why you do what you do and how you do what you do. And, 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 and we see fruit in your life that we want to have. And so we want to know these things. The first thing you must do is recognize that you need to be discipled by somebody in your faith. But after that, you have to bear fruit. What good is it and I know I'm a very blunt person, and sometimes that, that comes across, you know, where people are like, they're like, oh, he's just super rude. I don't want to waste your time. And honestly, I don't have enough time as a shepherd to minister to all the people in the flock right now the way I would like to. So if somebody comes and they say, hey, I, I got a problem and I want to do, I, I need your help. And then first thing I say is, okay, well, you need to change your behavior. 
So what does this look like? And then two to three days go by and they're not willing to change their behavior. There's only a couple of times I'm going to follow up and say, hey, thought we agreed we were going to do something together. Like we we're going to try something out here. It's like, oh, life's hard. Life's busy. Okay, guess what? My life hard is hard. My life's busy too. There's other people in the church who need us. I need to go move on because you're not interested in making adjustments. Now it doesn't, like, I don't think you're a bad person if that's where you're at. It's just, there's only so many resources one has in life and you need to put those resources where it's, it's, it's doing things in other people's life. They might come around in the future. There might be somebody else in the church who ends up discipling them, whatever. It doesn't mean you're condemned. It just means this isn't working because you have no interest to participate in this. So I'm going to back off and go try to help somebody else because I'm only one person. Jesus was not like me. He was so much better. So he could go to a mountaintop and he could sit down and he could speak words. But if you read throughout the gospels, when Jesus goes and speaks to people and there's all these mass crowds, when he goes and he's in the quiet time, there's not the same mass crowds don't stick around. You also don't hear about in the testimonies of the gospel, you don't hear the same things you hear about in the book of Acts when Luke is writing, where there's thousands saved day by day. Because people would come in here. So let that sink in for a second. You know, a lot of people will get frustrated with pastors or churches or people in churches. And they'll say, man, this pastor is just spitting fire today. It's straight from the word of God. It's Holy Spirit inspired. And they're out doing whatever they want to do. Why would you expect anything different? They did exactly the same thing to Jesus. Jesus was God in the flesh. Some people will hear and won't do. Some people will do but won't hear. And sooner or later, if you really are after being discipled on the mind of Messiah and the life of Messiah, you will get both. Because it says the Holy Spirit is the one who leads you to all wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. But you have to do something. You can't just wake up one morning and say, Lord, I prayed last night that the Holy Spirit would give me all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And the Holy Spirit's like, well, I heard your prayer, but I also gave you 45,000 different versions of the Bible that you've never decided to read. I also gave you an infinite amount of my time to pray and ask questions, and you just had one. Just lead me in this. Lord, make this go away. God, if you just make this go away, I will just totally be with you tomorrow. And like, I'll be all in. I'll be on fire for your kingdom. How many times have people made those statements and they don't do anything? They don't come. They don't follow. They don't follow up. It's just that moment of despair. We're reaching out for something. Once we bear fruit, we must go. This wasn't new with Jesus there's many, many examples throughout the scripture, including the Old Testament, where God calls somebody and tells them to go, tells them to do something. Abraham, the, 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 the father of all faith, Judaism, Christianity, the Israelites, Father Abraham was told to go. Noah was told to go build this ark and you will go. And then it says God shut the door and protected him. But Noah did what he was supposed to do. And there's many, many times throughout Scripture where that happened. So this wasn't something that just is a New Testament concept. It was something that is interwoven with the call of God to humanity. This is crucial and it's a fundamental way that I personally approach our counseling at HFF. Now, you'll say, well, we don't really have a discipleship program yet. You're absolutely correct, we don't. Last year... Every November, my wife and I, with our family, take a sabbatical. Sometimes it's a weekend, sometimes it's two weeks. Sometimes we've been blessed to, to take a full 30 days and go away. And, and during that time, we pray, we fast, we relax. But most importantly, we press into the Lord. And we ask, what do you want to do with HFF? Yes, I have been entrusted with this church. But it isn't my church. It is God's church. And I, well, every pastor says that. I promise you. That if I get my way, because I, I remember I'm a little bit more apostolic than I am pastoral. Sitting in a church for 20 years shepherding people is not a strength I come by without the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm a builder. I want to go build churches. I want to go build organizations. I want to go build cities. I want to renovate houses. I want to, th that's who I am. So by default, the Lord has placed April and I in this season to be pastors of this church. One of the only times I've heard the audible voice of God when I asked him to not be the pastor of this church. So every year we go back and we ask him, what is it you want to do? And then we attempt to do that. 
this past year, he said, you have to go deeper. You have to put deeper roots. And so we have intentionally been trying to do that first with leadership, with the pastors of the church, with the elders of the church, with the people who are deacons in the church, the people who were already in positional authorities and doing work of the church. We started to do that with them. Sometimes we schedule for an hour and it turns into an eight hour day that we're together. All of those things happen. Sometimes you get double pneumonia and you don't get to talk to anybody for for two weeks, 15 days, whatever it is. Things in life happen. But we've been intentional about that because how do you roll out a discipleship plan and a discipleship lifestyle if you haven't already started doing it as a leadership and say, well, what are our skills? What are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? How do we put each other together so that we can have the most impact on the other people in the church? Because again, we're being discipled into something How many of you want to be, oh, well, we're going to disciple you to be the best prayer team leads. And then you realize like, well, the person who's doing this doesn't have an active prayer life. They're literally reading a manual on what it means to be a prayer team lead. Like those things exist in some churches. That's not what we're doing here. Discipleship here needs to be a lifestyle. One of the most ironic things is I believe some of the best discipleship you can do is when you go to Costco. And you're like, people say, like, what, what do you mean? Well, everybody goes grocery shopping. Everybody eats. And so how many times do we think of like, well, today is the day of errands. It's going to be crazy. And we're running around. We're running around. Well, think about the hour you spend at Costco, at Walmart, at Crest, wherever it is. They can all sponsor our church with a donation through hff.church. It would be really great. Um, but think of all the time you spend going to Crest or to Costco or to Sam's or to Walmart or whatever it is. We're looking at the notes on your phone or your written list and you're doing that. Well, why couldn't you be doing life with somebody else in that moment? You're like, well, that's my me time. I have lots of kids and so I need my own time. Okay, I can understand. Don't take your kids. Go with another woman in the church. Go with another dude. I don't do grocery shopping unless it's dates with my wife. So we're not going to Costco, but I do eat. And so, shocker. And so, but like how many times do we do regular daily things And we just think of them as, uh, this is what we're supposed to do. And there are opportunities for discipleship lifestyle. One of the weirdest things that ever happened to me is a gentleman by the name of Nathan Harmon. He's an evangelist in the the Torah Passionate Movement. He was in town for a week. And anybody who knows me, like, I like my space. And I'm getting ready. I'm leaving the office and I'm running out. I got to run to Home Depot or Lowe's. And I don't even remember what I was doing, but I needed to run real quick. It was going to be a quick trip, 10 minutes, 13 minutes. He's running down the road. It's cold outside. He's got a hoodie on. He's got his athletic shorts on. And I knew he was going to come hang out at the office because he was in town. And so I didn't want to be rude. I rolled down the passenger side window and I'm like, hey, man, I got to run to Lowe's. I'll be back in about 15 minutes. Just go ahead. Have them let you into my office, hang out, whatever. I'll be back in a minute. And he opens the door handle and he's like, oh, I'm going to Lowe's with you. And I was like, I got a pistol in the car. <laughs> but it was a transformative moment where the Holy Spirit used him in that interaction to change something in my own heart. Where I was just running to Lowe's and I needed my own time and I'd come back and I'd give him my compartmentalize. I'd give him my time. He knew that, no, I'm going to go to Lowe's with you. And we're walking around Lowe's and he's like, How's your wife? How's your kids? How's things going? We're talking. And it's beautiful when you engage in regular life. So one of the things I think about how when we're approaching, what does it look like for discipleship here? Yes, you need to talk about the word of God. Yes, you need to dialogue about that. But you need to do life with each other. I know everything about the word of God, but my finances don't show it. My marriage doesn't show it. The cleanliness of my house doesn't show it. It's a lot you can do with each other when you do life with each other. You can find out who's got smoke screens and who doesn't. This is also why we host a Hanukkah party at our house. Like, come to our house, open our doors, see what it's like. I promise you, because we do all the deacons and pastors meetings and all that, I promise you it is just as clean throughout the week. If you don't believe me, ask Alyssa. It is. So when somebody comes and they're asking for counseling, they're asking for discipleship, or we're, we're, we're trying to engage that type of a lifestyle in this church, it is more than just, here's teachings, here's a YouTube link, here's this. 
It's creating and fostering leaders in the church who are bearing fruit, who can then help other people in the church bear fruit. But it takes you to be willing to do it. It takes them to be in a good place. I said this past Saturday, a lifeguard, a lifeguard when somebody is drowning and they're calling for help, a lifeguard doesn't immediately jump in willy-nilly and swim out in the middle of the water to that person. If that person is flailing about, a lifeguard's job is to make sure to assess the situation to bring stability to the chaos. That could either be by throwing some sort of object out and bringing them back to shore. That could be by a boat coming and bringing stability to pull them in. Or it could be them themselves wading into the water providing stability. But if you just jump into the water with somebody who's drowning, what happens? The lifeguard gets drowned too. Think of it from discipleship, not just from some sort of television show or some sort of Florida panhandle situation. If you're floundering around in your life, maybe it's in finances, maybe it's your spiritual life, maybe it's your prayer life and whatever it might be. What happens when somebody comes rushing? I will help you. I will disciple you. I will mentor you. And then all of a sudden you're like, yes, I need somebody. Praise God. And then all of a sudden you find out that they're flailing in the water the same way. So so when people come to me and and, and they're like, well, I need help. I need counseling. It's like, okay, well, this has been going on for seven years. Why why are you just coming to the leadership of the church now? Well, I went to so-and-so and I went to so-and-so and I went to so-and-so. What I realized is they all have the same problem. And it's like, Oh my goodness gracious. I understand now. And so I'd love to tell you today that this is the kicking off of rolling out a discipleship uh, uh, plan that we're going to engage in the church, but we're not there yet. We're simply not there yet. We're a lot further than we were in November of last year, but we're not going to roll out what these look like and how this works until we've tested it and the Lord approves it. That's just how this church works. Doesn't matter how awesome I might think a system or a plan is, if the Lord hasn't given a green light on it and it hasn't bore fruit, we're not going to do it. Because I'd be failing you if I roll something out and give you false hope that somehow we're going to disciple or we're going to mentor or we're going to get, and then all of a sudden you realize like, ooh, I might be worse off with them than I was on my own. So this is fundamentally how we approach this because I believe in discipleship at Costco. I believe in discipleship over dinner. I believe in discipleship over a cigar and beer. I believe in discipleship while you go do a a yard work at, at somebody's house. I believe in discipleship when you go to a baseball game or a football game. I believe discipleship from a biblical standpoint is doing life with each other and being open to have each other speak into each other's lives in those moments. That's important. But you have to be open to be willing for somebody to speak into your life. I I do find it uh, unusual in our corner when people are constantly using social media or emails or chat rooms or the things that are out there. And they're like, well, this is how you should do something. And it's like, you know what? That's biblically sound. We should do that. And it's like, "Uh, do you know who that person is? Because I know who that person is. And what they just gave you is not something they've done in their own life. So you probably shouldn't follow that counsel. Discipleship is about bearing fruit every day and then going and helping other people bear fruit. And honestly, the first portion of discipleship is your willingness to make an adjustment. It shows you're really willing to be mentored, to be coached, to be helped to overcome the things you're in. There's a, there's a philosopher, I believe his name is Adler, or a philosopher concept named Adler that basically says, we get what we want. So when somebody comes and says, I really need to lose weight, the Adler concept is, well, what do you do in your life? Well, I eat out every day, I drink Coke, I do all this stuff. Then you don't want to lose weight. Because the truth is, is you're saying you want something, but you're unwilling to do. You're not doing anything in your lifestyle to prove that's what you want. So you don't really, really want it. And I kind of touched on that a little bit with the past and the present and the future. You have power over it. So when people come and say like, I want to get out of debt. It's like, well, what's your budget? Well, you ain't going to get out of debt if you spend $100 at Starbucks every month. It's not going to happen. 
So there's a responsibility we have. Well, spiritually, it's the same thing. If you want to grow closer to Jesus, you have a responsibility to change what you do in your life. You have to take the scenario you're in and you have to weigh that against the model of what Jesus talked about with discipleship. They slept in the same place. That's probably not going to happen nowadays. Like it's just a little weird. I don't believe Jesus is creepy. So that's just a little bit weird. However, we do have times like the Feast of Tabernacles where we all go and we camp in a similar place. Eight days. You get to learn a lot about somebody when you spend eight days out in the wilderness with them, especially people who aren't regular campers. When we go to conferences or we do these types of things and you go and you stay in a similar place, a hotel or whatever it is, you get to learn a lot about people in that environment. And so well, that's a way we can do that now. Like, Isaac, you're not moving into my spare bedroom in my house. It's just creepy. It's not going to happen. And so, like, we're not going to do that. But there's ways to take those concepts and apply them today. Uh, same thing they ate. Like, how many of us think about sharing meals? You know, a lot of people will say, well, like, I don't know why you do table fellowship. Sometimes I don't even get to eat there. And sometimes the food isn't great or whatever. <laughs> The Bible says one of the greatest ways to enter into a covenant with somebody and to do life with somebody is to share food with each other. And that's why we do it. I'm pretty sure that our chicken dip that we have out there is better than the fishes and loaves that they were eating at that time. I could be wrong. I don't have any metric to go by. I wasn't present, so it's possible hearsay, but I'm just saying. To be a disciple of Christ is to be his image bearer on this earth. How do we do that? Matthew 6, tells us we're first to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, not your kingdom, not your righteousness. Romans 12, 2 tells us we're to transform our mind and practices to match Jesus. If there's a thought process you have that doesn't align with the word, you're to transform that to model his. If your parenting style does not match the Lord's, you're to change it. If how you talk to your spouse doesn't match how Jesus talked to others, you should change it. All areas of life, how you spend your money. If it doesn't match what God said to do, then you should change it. Transform your mind and your practices to match that of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Do all daily tasks as if they're under the Lord. I know a lot of people who they're like, ah, I go to job, my job and I do what I got to do to get out of there. No. Be the best employee ever. Be the best husband, best wife ever. Be the best parent ever. Be the best friend ever. Be the best. And I know that's hard. Look, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not telling you I'm up here that somehow like I get that all done. But this is the baseline of what we should be attempting to achieve. Do all daily tasks as if they were unto the Lord. Mark 10, 45. Serve others willingly and frequently. One thing I have found in the last two years of this church, the more outreach we do, whether it's Pentecost in the park, <laughs> service days, whatever, the more we're busy with that, the less grumbling you have. The less time I have to take issue with the Parkers because we're doing work together, Parkers and Frankies out to help somebody else. Serve others willingly and frequently. Do it. If you have the ability to move a couch, move a couch. If you have the ability to, to, to help somebody change their oil, change their oil. If you have the ability to help somebody, do it. And do it willingly and as often as you possibly can. Can you imagine if the hundred and something people who attend the church on a regular basis, or better yet, the 434 people I think that are in our active database, if they all did that for everybody else and we were doing it for everybody else, can you imagine how awesome it would be? You never have a need. There'd always be somebody there. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, bear fruit in your life so that others can see it. How will they know that, that you are his? Because you will look like him. You will talk like him. You will shine a light into the world. So discipleship is about bearing fruit. Why? So people can say, oh, Farah, you're driving this like super tricked out car, which means like you've made amazing financial decisions and the Lord's really, really blessed you. No, 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 no. It's not so that people can say Farah is driving some sort of sick ride. 
No, it's, it's because Farah is out there showing people that she can bless people with what she has, whether that's financials, whether that's spiritual gifts, whether that's compassion or joy, whether that's time. Gene, I'm going to call you out, brother. Uh, there's not a single Saturday that you are present in this church that I don't turn around at some point in time and you are serving others in a visible way while trying not to be visible. <laughs> and so that's what the Lord has called us to do. And I know you're not looking for accolades. And that's why I didn't tell you ahead of time I was going to do it. But you're doing it. And, and so, and other people do it too, but this is part of us being a disciple is by bearing the fruit of being an image bearer of Christ present. A lot of people are like, oh, I got to get out of here as quickly as possible. And yet there's people who stay and literally will take every trash can, including the ones that have one piece of trash out to make sure the people who come in for service on Sunday, that they know they're loved, that we love their facility and we want to bless them. And it happens from sweeping the floors to making sure people have their stuff. It, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And then Matthew 28, 19 through 20 as well. Testify of Jesus saving and transformative power. I have made a practice in my life. I am a very pessimistic person. I used to say all the time, I'm hopeful but not optimistic. And then the, one, of the, one of the guys I used to work with in ministry was like, how does that work? Just sounds like you're schizophrenic. And it's like, actually, yes, yeah, it does. <laughs> but the more you testify of what Jesus has done for you or what Jesus is doing around you, the less time you have to talk about negativity or to talk about all the problems in the world or the things that are going on. Um, the more you talk about how Jesus is working in, in, in the small things in your life, the less time you have to worry about Kamala and Joe and Donald and all the other people and all the things that, that the culture wants to engulf you in. Testify of Jesus' saving and transformative power. We can sit around in church and we can look around and we can say, that person isn't as holy as me. But if you talk about the testimony of who you were before you got to this point, it changes the whole concept. If you would have known me in my, my 18, 19, 20-year-old age, you would have never believed I was going to be a pastor. So when people look and they're like, hey, man, he, Pastor Chris, like, I, I'm just not sure how he does this. It's like, you should have seen me 20 years ago. God saved me. The fact that I'm even here is a miracle in and of itself. So praise God. So when you testify of what God is doing and or has done in your life or what you've seen him do in other people's life, it's very hard to be negative and downtrodden and to speak ill of other people. Discipleship is not a program. It's an invitation to be a part of a family. Jesus invited his disciples and all who would hear to come and do life with him. While it was true that Jesus spent more dedicated time with just the 12, there was also women and there was other people who traveled with him. Um, one of the things I find very ironic is in our corner of Christianity in the Messianic Hebrew roots side where we've come from, a lot of times people really want to downplay the, the available roles and influence women have. Women pretty much bankrolled the entire ministry of Jesus. Not only did Jesus come to women and go tell them to testify, but the women were the ones for the most part as they were traveling around preaching the gospel. And as the men were under studies of Jesus at that point in time to learn and apprentice, the women were the ones for the most part who were bankrolling the entire travels and what was happening. Now they weren't rich. They didn't have gold plated 20 inch spinners on their, on their uh, deer cart or whatever they had back there, the donkey cart. But the women were the ones, for the most part, who had bankrolled and helped fund what was happening. So God, God uses men and women alike in ministry. And this is part of the foundations of why this church is the way we, we are, is because God created all creatures, male and female. He's given you a calling. You, discipleship is not just for men. And yes, there are beautiful things that happen when older women who've done life teach younger women. 100% beautiful. But there's beautiful things that happen when couples get together. And they speak into each other's lives. There's beautiful things that happen. And there's women who learn things from other people's husbands in those environments and the conversations that are happening too. So again, you're discipled by everybody. It's either towards Christ or towards the world. Jesus in almost every town would teach and do the following. He would teach differently than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the religious leaders 
who had taken the seat of Moses. So at that time, they were proclaiming themselves as being the, the wisest and the authorities on the teachings of Moses. But the Bible and the scripture tells us they had taken a, a, a seat of holiness and authority that was not given to them. So Jesus' teaching to them was the very teachings of Moses through the lens of how they were supposed to be. And what were you supposed to do with those in the first century. And they were very, very different than what was currently happening from the religious leadership. So it's incomplete to just say that Jesus only taught the Torah and the prophets. The context is he taught the Torah and the prophets through the original intention and application in that setting. He called all who heard to a higher standard. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the things that existed before, there is not a doubt in the scripture that he calls them to a higher standard. Why does he call them to a higher standard at that point in time? Because Jesus understands that the Holy Spirit is going to come and be available to dwell in people when he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And when the temple was in physical brick and stone, nobody just willy-nilly walked into the Holy of Holies. The account we have of those who came and disobeyed the protocol of the Levites, especially for Yom Kippur, they died. So the model of the physical temple where the Spirit of God dwelled in the holiest of places, if the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit, is going to be available to dwell in here, it's a higher standard. And he tells us this in the Sermon on the Mount and everything else he does. Stop thinking in your mind that because I didn't pull the trigger, I'm not guilty of the transgression of the commandment. The fact that you're even looking for the loophole means you're guilty of the transgression of the commandment. Jesus is calling us to a higher standard. The gospel is a higher standard than the face value of the Torah and the prophets. Also, the Torah and the prophets were broken up into different categories, and we'll do that at some point in time. I know people hate when they talk about ceremonial laws and rituals, and, but the reality is, is there was laws and commandments that were given for certain purposes, i.e., I have a traditional Oklahoma roof. I, I'm a Torah-pursuant individual. I pursue the commandments of God. I don't observe because nobody here is flying back for Sukkot to Jerusalem. So, and there's no temple, so you're not bringing offerings. I have a traditional roof. You will come to my house, maybe for the Hanukkah gathering, if you still attend the church, if I haven't run you off with my theology by then. You will notice I do not have a fence around my roof. Why do I not have a fence around my roof when there is a commandment to put a fence around the roof? Because the commandment was a conditional commandment. If you had a flat roof, if you had a roof that people would partake in gatherings on of any type, you were to put a fence to protect them from falling and injuring themselves. If you're on my roof, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> so the, the commandments have a function. There's, there's deeper layers to that. And Yeshua is trying to teach us this because the Pharisees had created a whole nother measure of that on their side. God had come, he had modeled, and he was going to send his Holy Spirit to inhabit our physical bodies, temples of flesh and bone, not sticks and stones. Jesus regularly fellowshiped with the men and the women. Jesus broke bread and had table fellowship with those he met. The entire gospel of Luke outlines banquets of repentance. And the invitation to the people who came to these banquets and sat with Yeshua, they were not who the Pharisees or the political leaders, the Sadducees would have allowed to dine with them. This is interwoven in everything because it's even down to something as simplistic as this. There is a man for his entire life sitting outside the temple. Every day the religious leaders would come to the temple and they would offer their sacrifices and their alms and they would walk past this man who had been crippled from birth. And yet when Yeshua comes, he says, pick up and go. And show them, do what you have been commanded to do. There's a higher calling. It's people who were overlooked by the elite. Jesus went to them. The entire gospel of Matthew outlines banquets of honor. These banquets are in a a setting of the greater exodus. We talked about this a little bit on Saturday 
Traditionally in our corner, the greater exodus is talked about being a physical Passover exodus in the tribulation, whether in the beginning, in the middle, or the end. And out of that has come concepts of our diesel and our trucks will never run out and the Atlantic Ocean is going to part wide and we're going to walk right through to the New Jerusalem. The entire gospel of Matthew is through the concept of the greater exodus. What is greater than the first deliverance of the Hebrew people? The ultimate deliverance of the Hebrew people. What is the ultimate thing throughout the garden to the end of time that has been the slavery that we have dealt with? Sin and death. At the cross and by the shedding of the blood of Messiah, by him resurrecting and by him ascending, he has given us a path forward to the greater exodus, which is the exodus from the sinful nature and the death that comes with the sinful nature. It gives us the promise that through the blood and the atoning work of Yeshua, that we will have a greater exodus when everybody else died, went in the grave, decomposed and ceased to exist. We will be resurrected to life with him in the kingdom forever. It doesn't get, there's no higher stakes than that. The gospel of Matthew outlines those banquets of honor. They're a representation of the fact that Yeshua constantly broke bread and had table fellowship with people. In the book of Acts, Luke outlines four main elements. And this was part of the transformative teaching that started this direction of the church over the last couple of years. One of the four main elements, the top four that they committed themselves to doing One of the top four was to break bread together. Part of discipleship includes sharing meals. Whether it's just here, hopefully not at Chili's, but at some other place. I only say that because Chili's started 15 days of absolute time of rest and relaxation for myself. See, I'm, I'm trying to take my own counsel. I was going to be negative and I'm going to testify to Jesus. I got rest. Praise God. Woo. Preach, preacher. Jesus would also pray, lay hands, and cast out demons and heal. If prayer isn't an active portion of your individual life, and it's not an active portion of the relationships you have, if you're not actively praying for people who you have relationships with, if they need you to pray for them, if you're not actively praying for them, you are missing a crucial part of discipleship and what Jesus had as a part of his ministry. At the same point, I also want to point out, not everything is a demon. We don't need to be demon hunters. I've seen some people who take too far where they're like walking around the sanctuary every, every Saturday and they're like, there's a demon in the corner. It's like, why didn't you tell it to leave? Like, why, I mean, like, why are you telling me? Like, do we, need to get a, do we need to get like a Ron Howard in here and shoot a movie? Just tell it to go. Like, all of these opportunities were ways for Jesus to model to his disciples what a daily lifestyle should look like. I'm sure people in leadership of this church have a horror that comes over them when their phones ding. Because it's like, oh, is Chris really texting me about the church again? Is Chris really asking me a question about the church again? It's 11 o'clock in the evening. Is Chris asking me if I made it home? Like, what in the, like, discipleship is doing life with each other and caring at all times. And yes, I understand you can respond at some other point in time. It doesn't have to be this moment. But it's the point of loving somebody and talking to somebody. This is also why prayer is being attacked in public and in our schools or governments in our marketplaces because Jesus was trying to model these elements of life. When you start to pull them away from what you do, you start to neuter the power of God in the lives of people. We're supposed to be image bearers of Christ on this earth and we're supposed to help push back the darkness. Prayer is one warfare we've been given. Breaking bread with each other is another one. I know that sounds weird because like when you're praying, you're asking for the power of heaven's armies. When you're breaking bread with other believers, it says Jesus is there with you. Two or three are gathered in his name, he's there. Jesus is having that chili with you. He's sitting there with you. This is also why we see the attacks on the family dinners and, and the minimizing of, of the revelations of Jesus' teaching. The more you can minimize Jesus and the power that's there, the more you can neuter the power that the believers of Jesus can be discipled into. There's nothing wrong with discipleship classes, programs that are offered by churches and ministries, but I do believe that they're incomplete. 
because they have to have a lifestyle component. Some will say some of the discipleship programs that are done in small groups, and I think sometimes that, that does lead us more to that lifestyle component because normally in a small group, you know about their soccer games and you do those things. But the reality is, is as a church, we should be engaging in those corporately too. I know that's hard. It takes time. It takes development. But it shouldn't just be five people get together at Monique's house and they all do things that they like to do. And it's so much different than five people who get together in Southmore or Westmore. As a church, we should be getting together corporately more. And we're working on ways to do that as well as the individual. Again, I don't know if it's going to be in 2025. I would hope so. Everybody who knows me knows I don't like open-ended projects or open-ended tasks. But the reality is, is when God continues to show us and reveal these things and we continue to perfect them with fruit, then they will be more widely rolled out and not a moment before that. The Lord has created you to thrive in lifestyle components in all areas. Again, discipleship means you need to do something. This isn't name it, claim it. It's not like, well, we're going to have all the abundance of finances in the world just because God said I can do it and I can call it down. No, God's not going to reap you all these blessings when you turn around and you waste your money. God's not going to make you in the the greatest of physical health when you do everything in your power to eat and, and do things that harm that. You have to cooperate and work with God through creation. I also want to talk to you about the fact that discipleship, especially in a church, can be abused. Discipleship is about empowerment. For you to become the best version of who God has created you to be with the gifts God put inside of you. I want you to make sure that you understand those words because the truth is, is men and women alike have utilized discipleship and the need for discipleship to try to bring abuse into people's life. This is cultish behavior to try to say, well, you're not really cooperating with the discipleship program. And so I need you to look more like me and I need you to do this with your finances. And I have counseled people in this church. I have counseled them to fix things in their home before they fix things in the church. Empowerment of your home, empowerment of your marriage to model and be made in the image of Jesus first. If your home isn't being discipled and empowered to be like Jesus, you're going to bring the things that are not like Jesus here. And when you bring them here, they become my problems. I have enough problems. I don't need more problems. I create my own problems. I'm also human. So I don't need you to bring your problems here and just dump them here. We need to empower you with the power of the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Word of God so you can overcome them in your life so we can then go help other people to do that. And you can help me too. Because again, I'm human. I make mistakes. I have five kids. Like I don't do everything right. Discipleship should be an active daily participation of you with your lifestyle. Trips to the store, phone calls, text messages, lunches, walks, daily errands, hobbies. Discipleship is a lifestyle. Biblical discipleship is important. Discipleship is the most important thing, yet it's also the most dangerous things for humans if it's not done right. Who and what you're being molded into and taught matters. If you're a follower of Jesus, you must seek and desire desire discipleship. This should be done in a local community. You cannot be discipled by somebody who lives 18 hours away. You might be able to learn things from them, but they're not actively engaged in your life. And they only can disciple you based upon what you tell them. And in my experience, not everybody is transparent especially if they're not doing life. When Tyson and I are looking at each other eye to eye and we're doing that on a regular basis, he knows if I'm telling him that I'm, I'm telling him something that's truthful or not. I've been super happy. I'm not struggling with bitterness. He's like, whatever. I literally saw your face for an hour on Saturday. You are angry, struggling with bitterness, whatever. You can see those things no matter what your words say, no matter what your emails say. This is why local communities are important. Jesus himself was betrayed by one of the 12 that he discipled. So as you're being discipled and then you disciple other people, there is the possibility that you could get hurt. Just like with anything else that's worth doing in life, there are risks that comes with it. 
But there's also rewards that come with it. I want to leave you with some chapters if you want to do a little bit more digging in on some of the discipleship models and some of the information in scripture. Leave you with some of those scripture references to be able to go study on your own. There's three really three discipleship models I really, really like that are engaged in scripture. They're, the one is obviously Jesus and his disciples. Like I just love seeing how the creator of the universe chose to go about this. Um, Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, Luke chapter 11, and John chapter 15. Those are all chapters I really recommend you going and reading the entire context of the chapter and see how Yeshua engages with them. Uh, the whole book of Acts is amazing, but Acts chapter 2 is, is a really good chapter when you want to see about the discipleship of the early church. There's a conflict when Luke is writing this because obviously there's, there's still a lot of people who don't believe Jesus is the Messiah and they're doing these things. And all of a sudden, Jesus is the Messiah. That whole, that whole thought process was really gaining steam. And so there was a lot of conflict uh, that was going on in, in what they did. So Acts chapter 2 shows a discipleship model of the early church. And then Paul and Timothy's relationship. Um, that's, that's one that I really, really like when you look at discipleship because Paul obviously was not one of the original 12. Paul came after the original 12. And so then hearing the testimonies of how he engaged in his relationship with Timothy, I think is important. And you can find that in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Acts chapter 16. You can find testimony of that. So uh, once again, this is kind of just an overview of discipleship. Um, our, our goal is to have discipleship as, as a, a fundamental fabric of this church. Um, I, I believe that will be multifaceted. It will be classes on Tuesday nights, which again, we're coming up on the end of this one. And then there'll be more of like Sunday school style well, where there'll be an outline that'll go ahead of time. We're going to have a little bit more engagement in those conversations. Um, we've talked about maybe doing a worship song or two, maybe bringing in some food. Uh, there's a lot of things being talked about. We've got some time to sort that out. That'll be a portion, but there also has to be a portion of the daily life that you do with each other. Prayer, all of those things. And so um, working with the deacons and the pastors and the elders. So we have people who've done that already who can then, they bore fruit, they can go out and help do that with other people in the church. And then other people in the church can go out and do that for other people in the church and so on and so on and so on. And so that is something that we're definitely working on. Um, before we pray out tonight, any, any thoughts, any, any questions, any, anything along those lines? Doesn't even, I guess, necessarily need to be on tonight. You know, we have the newcomers lunch this Saturday. Uh, for anybody who is newer to the church, who wants to know kind of, you know, the under underbelly of the church history and the church structure and the leadership and kind of go over that. But any anything, anybody feel like, Ava, you got anything you want to interject tonight? No, you're getting tired. Long day. Co-op and then Hannah. I heard, I heard you beat up on her in Monopoly. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you, Izzy. I think that is Holy Spirit inspired. It was tongues, tongues of fire. So, yes. Way to be supportive of a younger brother. All right, well, let's pray out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to study your word, to, uh, to talk about you, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, we lift up Brent tonight to you again. Uh, uh, just be with him, help heal him. Um, be with the others who are sick, Lord. Uh, be with the others who are struggling. Uh, Lord, be with us this week as, uh, as we go back to work and school and, and all the things that happen. Be with us, lead, guide, and direct us. Uh, continue to mold and make us into the image of you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.